Surrender your booty! Welcome back, everyone. This is going to be the first episode of I Played a Thing, Dark Souls 2, Scholar of the First Sin, in 2016. I am Un, and with me today is Salad in the Bandit Gear. I do hope you all had an excellent New Year's Eve, and the 2016 is treating you well so far. Uh, last time out, I was thinking we might finish up with Broom Tower, but things didn't work out that way, so hopefully this time we'll be able to conclude our matters with the second DLC and be all ready to go for the first. We do have a couple of preliminary bits of business to take care of before we launch back into the DLC area, though. First of which is going to be... A quick look at the Smelter Hammer. And that is just huge. Bigger than we are tall. Now I cannot actually use this weapon properly in one hand, being as it does require, as I discussed, a massive 70 strength to use it one-handed, highest in the game. However, since it only requires half of that to use in two hands, we can have a look at the two-handed moveset. And this weapon is very, very slow, as you might expect and I'm not a real uh, big experimenter with it because using it two hands means you're not using a shield and well I can't possibly have that but you know if I were a little more willing to go the shieldless route I think I'd actually kinda like the moveset here I mean it is slow but unusually for a great hammer the R1 combo or whatever the light attack is on your means of control has real good horizontal coverage. One horizontal swing into a spin to win right there in the main combo. And then with the R2s, you have your vertical coverage. And the second hit of that R2 combo, or the second swing I should say, does hit in front of and behind you, so that's a nice bonus as well. Not bad, not bad at all. But the really interesting stuff comes in some of its auxiliary moves, so to speak. The ones not on the regular combos. For starters, there is the running two-handed strike. It's hard to see quite what exactly is going on there. The idea of it is... That leap... That leap does a body check which does zero damage if it connects, but it staggers the opponent, meaning that the second hit, where you actually drive the hammer into the ground, well, they're not going to be able to avoid that because they've been staggered by your belly bump. Not a whole lot of people I've seen using the smelter hammer in PvP, but those that do tend to make pretty good use of the belly bump because, well, it's a little faster than your average running attack, and once that hits, that second smash, it's, uh as far as I know, inescapable. But the most fun of all is a move that I just like to call Lawn Dart. That's what you get if you're holding this two-handed and try to parry. You cannot parry with the Smelter Hammer, you get something magical instead. <laughs> I will never get tired of that. Yep, you just do three big swinging... swinging? Swinging strikes followed by launching yourself like a human lawn dart. Needless to say, this is a little bit dangerous around cliffs, but oh, it's just so much fun. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> Let's see that one more time from the front. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Graceless but powerful, because if you manage to get every single hit of that combination, well, I think just about anyone is going to die. Unless they have an ungodly amount of armor or, uh, and or HP. Alright. That's quite enough of that. I'm at almost 80% of my equip weight, and I'd like to have my, uh, my fast roll back. So, back to our trusty greatsword. Now next up is to take a look at the boss armor that we unlocked for defeating the Fume Knight. Normally, when we get access to boss armor, we will find it with our buddy Malin here in Majula. 
However, that is not the case this time, since this boss was kind of associated with the Iron King and the Iron Keep, we'll have to go back and visit our buddy Magarold. So please do bear with me for a moment while I find my way back to our good merchant buddy from Lanafir. I'm actually a little disappointed that I'm not one-shotting alone knights at this point. I thought I might be. Close, but no cigar. There you are. I knew there was going to be one coming after me in here. I bet you my R2 will one-shot him. Jackpot. I believe there's going to be someone running in from the side. Is someone going to be running in from the side? I thought that usually happened. What about you, great bow guy? Is it you that usually runs down? You're just gonna stand there shooting your bow. Alright, well, fine with me. Oh, there you are. I guess you just didn't aggro like you usually do. Wasn't making enough noise for him. Oh, and the bow guy did come down eventually. Well, that's alright, just a bit of extra souls for me, and wow, my R2 didn't even one-shot him. It's a bit peculiar. Oh, enough of that. We came here to visit old Mags, and visit him we will. Well, where have you been? Oh, around. So, notice that this is not actually referred to as the Fume Knight set. It is actually listed in-game as Rame's Equipment. So, in case there was any doubt in your mind as to who that gassy gentleman was, well, doubt no more. The Rebel Reign, after his defeat at the hands of Velstadt, came to Broom Tower in search of greater strength. When he found it, it came not from a regal father figure like before, but from a newfound mother who gave him true purpose. And we should buy something while we're here just to be nice to, uh, to our buddy Magarold. Cheers. Cheers to you, buddy. So yeah, looks like Nadalia was a bit of a mother figure to old Rame. Wouldn't surprise me one bit if there was a little bit of an Oedipal thing going there too. I don't know if it was a strictly familial relationship. In fact, I highly doubt it. <laughs> nice. Anywho. Speaking of Nadalia, the next thing we need to do is take on an optional boss in Broom Tower in order to get the last smelter wedge so that we can take care of Nadalia once and for all. However, I am sitting on a pretty good pile of souls and the optional boss in question is a tough one so I want to spend up a little bit before we go crashing the party. Bearer of the until so let's see. How many levels can I get? Two, three, three. Let's take two in adaptability and one in HP. That seems like a good deal. Alright. Save the last bit. I'll go ahead and leave my life protection ring on. And we will head back to the Smelter Throne. You may recall when we previously visited the Smelter Throne to activate the bonfire beyond all the prowlers, we saw a big old set of samurai armor, but we took a look at it and couldn't do a thing with it. Well, for whatever reason, it activates once you defeat Raim and becomes very dramatically glowy.
And boss ahead indeed. Well, as long as you have the Ashen Mist Heart in your possession, you can use it here on the armor and go into another memory. And here we have the memory of the old Iron King. This is a little bit different from most Ashen Mist Heart memories. This one does not have a time limit. And a damn good thing that is because it takes a while to pick your way through this one properly. And dashing through it is not advisable. And we've got two potential NPC summons here. First of which is a new one, Steel Willed Lori. He's got a great shield, a Zweihander, and Mastodon armor, which you would think would make for a pretty impressive tanky figure. However, in my experience, well, Lori is just not very good. She dies a lot faster than you would expect from someone with this kind of loadout. However, over here, we can hook ourselves up with Drifter Swordsman Idol, who we previously encountered in Belfry Soul. And it looks like an actual player just dropped a summon sign. And that's even more valuable. So Voss, come on down. Howdy. I like your meat cleaver there. Anyway, this seems to be a memory of the heyday of the old Iron King's kingdom, so as you might guess, we're gonna encounter quite a few alone knights in the neighborhood. They're also gonna have our fair share of uh, salamanders kicking around. Now because this is a bit later in the game, the alone knights are a bit tougher and stronger than ones we've previously encountered, but they don't have any new moves, they don't have any behavioral changes. And sometimes they don't pay attention the way they should. Oh, hi there. Sometimes I don't pay attention the way I necessarily should. Oh, that went a bit wrong. That's right, enough of you. Now then, the nice thing about the salamanders here is there's always a way to get behind them. And when you're behind them, there's absolutely nothing they can do to you. They don't have a tail swipe or anything like you'd expect like that that actually allows them to do harm to you when you're standing behind them. Couple nice bits of treasure there. Me not paying attention. Really now, a man in full plate armor shouldn't be able to sneak up on me. Need to be a little more attentive than that. Voss is helping out with uh, yet another alone knight here. We will not let our aggro drawing be in vain there. Now, did I miss a way? Yeah, I did miss the way to get behind this salamander. I do want to take them all out just so they're not causing trouble while we're fighting with other things. Oh, hi, Captain. What brings you up here? Thank you, Voss. That was very helpful. Now if we just creep around this way... We can take out the last of the salamanders on this floor. Once again, while we're behind it, can't backstab it or anything. It is not humanoid enough for that, but there is just not a damn thing it can do to defend itself. And now we proceed down the hole to the next floor. Now uh, while we're down here, we're going to have another big old stack of alone knights, some of which have great bows, and they will cheerfully shoot at you from quite a ways away, so something to be careful of. Oh, come on, Salad. You know what I meant to do. Yeah, we've got some, some archers there, 
And we've got the katana guy right here. Oh. So a little bit of care in how you proceed is definitely warranted. And we could continue right along to the boss if we go the rest of the way down the hallway on my right there. But there are some more treasures to obtain, so let's not be in too much of a hurry. Free repair powder is always welcome. Now then, let us descend the stairway over here. Oop, oh, hi knight. And dude was not paying attention at all. Oh, the bow guy was though. Yeah, come on out. Oh, that never stops feeling good. Now let us creep around behind the salamander in our usual fashion. And soon it will trouble us no more. I've got to say, even if it is against a mostly defenseless opponent, it does feel good pulling out a 1600 damage combo. Now then, I think we've pretty much cleaned up all the enemies around here. But there should be a little bit of treasure kicking around if we know where to look for it. Not here. I don't think there's anything super exciting down here, but... Oh, I've gone and climbed back up. Well, if memory serves, the only thing that was really lurking around down there was a slightly upgraded twin blade. Like a plus seven twin blade or something like that. And you know what? I want to keep things moving. I don't want to keep my jolly cooperator waiting. So let's go ahead, get down here, get healed up, and get ready to rock. And just for shits, I'm going to put on my fully repaired greatsword. Weapon buff. Good idea. And now it is time to take on... The true one night alone. Just you and me. Alright. Alone is a very tough opponent. He is not as powerful as Rain and doesn't have the elemental damage, so that's one thing you don't have to worry about. So tanking him is definitely a more viable prospect. However, he is incredibly fast. And he can still put quite a hurting on you, even if not as bad as the one Rain can. Fighting him with a slow weapon is particularly challenging, because he just recovers for most of his regular strikes in a great hurry. So what you usually want to do if you're fighting with a slow weapon like I am, is get him to do one of those dashes at you, dodge roll it, and then get your hit in when he's recovering from that, because his regular strikes he recovers from much faster than he does the, uh, the dash. And if you block the dash, you probably won't have enough time to get a hit in afterward. He also sometimes incorporates a dash into the end of his combos, as you saw there. And dodge rolling that is another good opportunity to get your hit in. He also has a jumping helmet splitting style strike. And dodge rolling that is pretty easy because he telegraphs that handily. That move where he charges up his sword with dark energy and slashes it, that is an unblockable. If he lands that, it works like a grab, and it will power him up. He'll drain some of your strength and use that to, uh, to increase his attack power. Not a situation you want, so you want to be careful when he telegraphs that, which mercifully he does. Also, projectile which may be the other thing that you have coming when he causes a glow from his weapon. And just like Rain, he occasionally does get staggered a little bit, but as you can see, he recovers quickly enough to murder me. Sorry about that, Voss. And 
to say it is a very nicely dramatic fight. The way he, uh, takes you on in that room full of finely polished floor tiles and, uh, that big orchestral choral music score in the background. It's a good fight. Not quite as much of a knuckle-biter as the Rain one, but it's dramatic. I like it. And man, the way he can dash at you. I think that's exactly why he keeps such a meticulously polished floor. Is so, uh, you know, in his socks he can just slide at you and whack you clear across the room. Just like, uh, Tom Cruise in Risky Business. Dun 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 dun. Well, it looks like Voss is ready for another go. And even if I managed to get myself killed, you were a very good cooperator type of person, so... My apologies. Let's see if we can make a better go of it this time. I won't need to worry about the looting, we just need to hack and slash our way through. And get ready to take on alone once again. It would be nice if we could just sprint through this area, but the alone knights are just too damn fast for that. They will catch up with you before you reach your destination, and they will fuck you up. Oh! Sometimes they'll fuck you up anyway. Also, their poise is actually pretty decent, so you can't really count on stun locking them. At least not easily. Yeah, I see you coming my way. I see you coming my way. Um, even if they are a very familiar enemy type at this point, getting ganged up on by alone knights is no fun at all. Well, Voss seems to have the salamander there all taken care of with the bow. Didn't realize those, uh, those guys were vulnerable to poison. Or at least if I did recognize that at some point, I had since forgotten. Oh, dear God in heaven! That, that didn't work out for me at all. Let me get out of here. Whew! Right. Well, thank you, Voss, for your ranged assistance there. Once again, I nearly made a dog's breakfast of things, but we're both still alive, and that's what's important. So if this is Voss, where's Crawley? 100 internet points to anyone who gets that reference. Alright, that's one of the great bow guys down. The other great bow guy will be down in a moment. Dude, that is not a melee weapon. I don't know what you want to tell me, but it just isn't. No need to worry about the salamander this time, it can't hurt us where we're going. I'm going to quickly replace my bow here with the quick one, just so we can be nice and respectful to Sir Alone. I don't know if you noticed it, but as he stands up before the fight starts, he does give you a little bow, so let's return the favor. Make it all sporting and honorable and shit. Oh, 
Respect bow. Ah, his recovery is just so good. That is probably the single most dangerous thing about him. Especially, again, if you use a slow weapon like I tend to favor. I actually have half a mind to try the hammer out against him, but I have poison infused it, and he is not vulnerable to poison, which means it's not going to be as effective as it could be. Also, even if he is not focusing on you, you do have to be careful if you're attacking his back, because that giant katana or nodachi or whatever it's supposed to be, that has huge backswing, and it can hit you even when you're standing almost perfectly behind him. Yeah, when he incorporates that dash into uh, one of his combos, that can be a really good time to uh, be ready to go on the, uh, the dodge roll, so that you can slide out of the way of it and get your hit in. Like so. I find that a little bit easier to time the dodge of than when he just, uh, just straight up leads off with a dash. Oh! Caught me napping. Quick drink! Whew, just in time. Kinda pinned me in the corner with the column there, too. And as you can see, he has a kick, which will take off quite a bit of your stamina, but if you're using a great shield, you're probably gonna be fine. At least it's not the grab. There's that jumping attack I was talking about. He telegraphs that one very nicely, so... Usually it's a pretty good thing to uh, dodge roll and counter. Oh, and there's that backswing I like to talk about. Drinky drink. Oh, see? The timing on that, there's a little bit of a delay, which makes it a little tougher for me. Oh, he staggered. Just like Rain, you do get him staggered after a while. And that's an opportunity to get a little revenge in. Oh! That's another thing about that lead-off dash. I think it does more damage than anything else you can do, including the grab. Speak of the devil. Almost done. Almost done. Just can't choke. Blow! Great job, boss. Very satisfying. And not too bad. On my practice run, I actually had more of a struggle with alone than I did with uh, Rame. Killed me a bunch of times. Then again, in my practice run, I didn't really have much in the way of co-op assistance and had to do it with, uh, with the NPCs. Ah, praise that son. Thank you, message. I did it too. Life indeed. Not only life, but here's what we came for. The final smelter wedge. Now then, before we actually leave the memory, let's take a quick look at that boss soul we just collected. Sir Alone came from an eastern land and became the king's most trusted knight. Well, not really any new information there about our samurai buddy, but, well, it is what it is. And we do still have Rame's soul kicking around our inventory. I'm just hanging on to that for the moment because we're going to be uh, collecting a few boss souls here and then we can trade them all in in a single trip. Alright then, now that we've collected the final wedge, we can examine the throne again. 
to make our way out of the memory. And we now wield the Doom of Nadalia in our hands. Natty, what do you think about that? Alright, I'm not really sure about the, uh, the, uh, you're blind with nerve thing there. That just seems like a very strange phrase to me. But to be honest, I'm not hearing anything else accurately, so we'll go with that. Anyway, if we can head on back to the foyer of Broom Tower, then we'll be almost ready to go and write the final chapter of The Bride of Ash. I kind of wonder if this is strictly ethical to do. I mean, one may assume that her power is pretty much limited to the tower at this point. Don't know if she's any threat to the rest of the world. And Adalia is clearly shithouse rat crazy, but, well, she didn't choose what she is. Nevertheless, for LP purposes, I think it's best if we put her down once and for all. So we will crack open this door. Oh, and yes, there's a bit of preparation I should definitely do that I don't want to forget about. This particular Ashen Idol does have the Darkness and Curse aura. And to avoid the effects of the curse, we're definitely going to want to put on our zombie mask. Brains. Now you can kind of see down there there is an Iron Soldier, and it is covered in ash. That means it has the defensive buff, which kind of sucks. But running through all the enemies here is no fun at all. So we are going to try and take them out before we proceed onward. Ooh, nasty nasty. I think this particular Nadalia might actually also have the uh, resurrection power. But that doesn't really matter because she can only actually resurrect possessed armors, not these guys. Oh, and there's the Curse Aura kicking in. Don't know if we can actually counteract the Magical Darkness with Cast Light. Let's try and see if it works at all. Oh, that actually does seem to help. Good. Be wary of Pointless? I'll be the judge of that. And I judge that to be correct. Anyone else over here? I don't see anyone. But I hear Nadalia. It's making all kind of noise down there. Got some treasure here though. So we'll take care of that little matter first. And it's a pretty good treasure indeed. Let's press a little deeper down. I'm sure there are going to be some iron soldiers waiting for us. Yes, indeed. A couple of halberd guys, that's kind of dangerous. Oh, and a possessed. I'm backing off. You still want some? And that defense buff is potent. Alright. I'm not entirely certain whether or not this one has the resurrection power, so let's go ahead and test it out on Mr. Possessed Armor over here. If he wants to re-aggro on me. I don't want none of your great bow. Oh yeah, he's gonna revive. 
So let's go ahead and take care of Nadalia real quick, like. Because here she is. The final Ashen Idol. close, ended up with just a pixel of health to my name there. But we did it! And we can claim our final fragment of the soul of Nadalia. Nadalia is no more. True soul of Nadalia acquired. Well, once again, Better luck next time, Bride of Ash. I suppose we can take off our zombie mask now. I believe there is one more treasure down here that we want to make sure that we obtain. I talked about one really good pyromancy that you could get in this DLC, and that is what I believe I am going to find down here, if memory serves me correctly. Yeah, Fire Snake. That is some pretty good stuff. We'll take a look at that and the boss soul as soon as I get back up here. Alright, let's give our new goodies a quick looking at. Soul of Nadalia, Bride of Ash, who renounced her flesh and wandered Broom Tower. In the act of dancing, the Bride of Ash was transfigured as smoke, enticing people to her residence, and so her seat of power came to be known as the Broom Tower. And this is the wondrous soul of this Augur of Solitude, you may recall that each of the daughters of Manus, the Children of Dark, embody one of his characteristics. We previously tangled with Ilana, the Squalid Queen, who was the embodiment of his wrath. Well, apparently Nadalia was the embodiment of his loneliness, which I guess kind of explains her fixation on the old Iron King. Again, she was absolutely bugshit crazy, but... I do feel sympathetic toward the Bride of Ash. Sounds like she was a hell of a dancer, too. Ah, well. Alright, then. Next thing we're gonna do is pay that visit to uh, King Vendrick that I cancelled out of last time. Because we can have a conversation with him that makes a little more sense now that we've actually uh, collected the soul of Nadalia. So it's back to the undead crypt for us. And we should be able to make our way toward the king pretty quickly. Hey, your highness! I found another crown! Check it out! Seeker of fire, I see you've subdued another foul creature. One of the father of the abyss spawn. That confounded quintessence of humanity. The abyss once had form, but then dissipated. And yet, traces of its existence endured. Each fragment, thirsting for power, spread dark with no relent. My dear Chandra was one such fragment. A feeble, 
tiny thing that thirsted for power more than any other. Driven by insatiable lust for a worthy vessel. Fire came to be, and with it, disparity. Heat and cold, life and death, light and dark. Dark was seen as a curse. Shadow is not cast, but born of fire. And the brighter the flame, the deeper the shadow. Inherit fire and harness the dark. Such is the calling of a true leader. Dark was shadow and in such. Well, yeah. A lot of stuff just dropped on us there. Not a whole lot in terms of raw verbiage, but important stuff. Hi, Velstot. Uh, the reason that I wanted to wait until uh, until I finished up with Nadalia there, as you might have guessed, is because the king talks about subduing another foul creature, another uh, another fragment of madness. So that does come across a little more appropriate after you have dealt with Nadalia. And the big reveal there is the fact that Nashandra. The Queen of Drang Lake. His queen is another fragment of Manus. A feeble tiny thing, apparently, but one with a great lust for power, even compared to the other Children of Dark. Hmm. Interesting stuff. And it's going to be very, very important. Won't want to give away too much more just yet. We will piece it together, uh as we go into the very end of the game. And also I'm going to have those uh, conversations with Justin Carpenter that I'm going to put up as Omake. Don't know if you'll all be interested in actually listening to all that, but... Well, we do a lot of talking about the uh, the plot and Vendrick and Nashandra's role in it. I do find it interesting that even knowing all this and even after being dead ultimately because of her schemes, now, well, Vendrick still calls her my dear Chandra. So I think, uh, in spite of it all, he really did love her. Well, I guess that goes to explain some of the rather cryptic and harsh things that Nashandra was saying to us when we talked to her in the castle. But enough chatter about that for the moment. We have now got three, three shiny new boss souls, and we've got some trades to make. So, all three of them have things that we can uh, look at at Ornifex's place. We'll ultimately want to go to Strades to trade one of them in, but we have possible trades for them all at Ornifex's place, so I'm going to head on down there, and even the one that we don't want to trade in there, we can take a look at the item description for it. So I will rejoin you there in just a bit. Oh, looks like I've been invaded by a random forlorn spawn on my way to Ornifex, so we'll go ahead and get that on camera. Yeah, you can let me combo you for more than half your life, I don't mind. I will gladly accept the human effigy. Oh, forgot about the Basilisk here. Oh, that's easily remedied. Hey, Orny! Alright. First thing... So we can trade in the Soul of the Fume Knight for either the Fume Sword, which is a regular great sword. Well, actually, no. Looking at it now, it is a straight sword. Primarily a dex weapon. Or we can trade it in for the Fume Ultra Great Sword, which is primarily a strength weapon, but has a surprisingly stiff dex requirement. 
This is a straight sword forged from the, forged from the soul of the Fume Knight and imbued with the dark of Nadalia. The exile swordsman Raim had the ability to expunge the Black Fog, but chose instead to live alongside it in the company of the Child of Dark that haunts his sword. Hmm, interesting. So he was powerful enough to take down Nadalia, but decided she was... Hmm, rather, someone he'd rather buddy up to. And yes, indeed, I think this weapon does cause a bit of dark damage. Not entirely certain of that, but I believe that to be the case. Yeah, looking at the stats over there, that does appear to be the case. So if you like your straight swords and you like your inherent dark damage, there's your option. But the Fume Ultra Great Sword I find to be a little bit more interesting. The Exile Swords. Oh, okay, same description. Thought it would be a different one. Alrighty, uh, this weapon... Again, huge damage, uh, excellent strength scaling, if you have the decks you need in order to wield it. You may recall that Raim would sometimes hide behind his Ultra Great Sword in the first stage of the fight, use it to block with. Well, that's relevant here, because this weapon has unusually good stability for a weapon. So if you have it in your offhand, or you're two-handing and you block with it, it actually makes a pretty good shield. And on top of that, uh, some of its actual swings have block frames. That is to say, while you're actually swinging the weapon, some of the frames of animation of the swing will cause attacks to rebound off. So for such an offensive monster of a weapon, it has more defensive uh, value than you might expect. I'm going to go ahead and claim that one. Over here we have the Bewitched Alone Sword. Primarily a dex weapon, although it also has uh, some pretty stiff requirements on its other stat. This is the only thing you can trade the soul of Sir Alone for. Katana forged from the soul of Sir Alone. The captivating, undulating design serves to enhance this weapon's mystical allure. Alone came from the east, and soon became the Iron King's most trusted knight. When he departed, the old king bequeathed Sir Alone's name to his iron warriors. So that's why those guys are called the Alone Knights. Obvious enough. We might as well take that. And one other uh, interesting little bit of data about that is that uh, the name of it in the Japanese version refers specifically to a type of possessed sword that thirsts for blood that you see sometimes in Japanese folklore. Can't remember the term off the top of my head. I will try and find it out and throw a caption in when I put this video up. And finally, we have one of the two items here that we can trade the true soul of Indalia for, the Chime of Screams. Pretty solid wisdom requirements. I'm sorry, faith, it's not wisdom in this game. Decent scaling on both lightning and uh, darkness. It is a sacred chime forged from the soul of Nadalia, Bride of Ash. Nothing appears sacred about the frightful design of this chime, but it does have the benefit of raising one's faith. The oozing, frozen iron forming the bell seems to anticipate a scream. Well, as the description says, it does grant you a few additional points of faith. And again, the scaling in both, uh, for both miracles and dark hexes is decent, but as far as I'm concerned, you really never want to take this item. Reason being, the Chime of Screams has the slowest casting time of any spell tool in the game by a huge margin. I'm talking like, hit the cast button, go make yourself a snack, then come back and watch your spell go off. I suppose you could possibly use it to screw with people's timing in PvP, but yeah, you really just don't want to wait half an age for your spell to come out usually, so I think that really kind of ruins this item. Kind of neat imagery, though. Come back again if you find another soul. I surely will. Now, I would say the preferable choice by far is the other item we can get for the soul of Nadalia, which we will have to go to our bold buddy Strayed in order to acquire. I also think that said trade costs a fearsome 100,000 souls, so let me spend one of my consumables real quick, like. That will suffice.
And back to the Bastille we go. Hey, been a while, buddy. So, if you pick up. I know, I know. And what we can trade for Nadalia's soul here. Oh, it's 45,000. I didn't need to trade that in. Oh well. What we can trade in Nadalia's soul for here is the Pyromancy Outcry. Now, this requires two attunement slots. And unless you have tremendous, um, what do you call it? What's the name of that stat? Attunement. Oh man, brain fart there. Unless you have tremendous attunement or uh, you have an um, equipment on that gives you more castings, you will only get one use of it. But it is the most powerful spell in the Firestorm family. You know, Firestorm, Chaos Storm, Fire Tempest. Well, this one outdoes them all. It is the combination of fire and darkness that you would occasionally see some of the Ashen Idols using, like that first one we encountered. Spouts multiple dark flames. This child of dark, bearing inconceivable strength, found herself in a kingless land devoid of souls, and in journeying there has all but condemned herself to a fate most wretched. And indeed, that is a fate that we sealed with our own hands. Let's go ahead and pick up Outcry then. Uh, something else that I find interesting about that description is the fact that it says uh, Nadalia came to the Kingdom of the Iron King bearing inconceivable strength. Now, it's a bit of a stretch, but some people have taken that to mean that Nadalia was particularly powerful, even as Children of Dark go. She may, in fact, have been the strongest of all of Manus's fragments, and so if that is the case, then we may consider ourselves very lucky that we did not fight her in her original form, that she had already surrendered her body and sealed herself up in the Ashen Idols by the time we got here. So if we had had to fight her in her original form, that, uh, that could have been a bit of a sticky wicket. Well, anyway, we've gotten almost up to the one hour mark, but I think there is a bit of time left after I do the editing and so on, so what I'm going to do is go ahead and get started on the next DLC. Uh, I won't really launch right into it, but we will take care of some of the preliminaries, and then when we return next time, we'll be all set to actually get started making our way through. Well, let's see, what is the closest bonfire going to be? I think our best shot is going to be... Yeah, Ruined Fork Road. Because what we need to do is make our way toward the Shrine of Winter. That being where the teleporter to the DLC can be found. Now straight ahead there goes to Aldius Keep. This way goes to Drang Lake Castle. Oh, forgot about that three hitter. I don't know if I remembered to ever mention it, but these falconers, they can drop sunlight medals. So if you want to level up the Sunbro Covenant without actually doing tons of PvP, or if you're just leveled up too high to find uh, co-op partners anymore, then that is one way you can do it. Just uh, get yourself in the company of champions so you get unlimited respawns, and just come here and farm the uh, whatchamacallit, the, uh, Falconers. Sorry, had another brain fart there. Oh, you sneaky Pete.
Oh, I'm not gonna die now. No, no, no. Quite enough out of you, my friend. Also, this area didn't actually have falconers in it in the vanilla release, so farming for sunlight metals, you have a better place to do that in Skullwar the First Sin. And here we are finally at the Shrine of Winter, and we can warp to the third and final DLC area. And we have gone from a world of fire to a world of ice. It also just occurred to me that I have not actually attempted the co-op dungeon in uh, the second DLC, so that's another thing we'll do next time. But we've already come here, so we're going to go ahead and do the preliminaries of this area, and yeah, well, we'll take care of all that next time. Oh, you know what? It also just occurred to me I didn't actually look at the plaques at the entrance to this DLC area, so I should do that. One moment. Here we go. Forbidden is the path to Forbidden is the path to the ancient king's domain. With water dry and path amiss. Woeful temptation is dismissed. I still don't know what that's supposed to mean. Trespassers will efface adversity, befitting a monarch. Again, all things we're familiar with. Aleum Lois, land of the Ivory King, lies cold as death. Nary a hint of warmth remaining. Well, first time out then, we had Shulva. Second time we had Broom Tower. Looks like this time we will be journeying to Aleum Lois. And as we had the crown of the Sunken King and the crown of the Old Iron King, this DLC is Crown of the Ivory King. Rather handsome, wintry place. And Elaine Lois certainly looks well defended. If you thought that might be the voice of our next child of dark, well, give yourself a gold star. Rather interesting thing she had to say there about wanting us to turn back and the old chaos hungering. You'd think she'd want to beckon us into the maw of whatever chaos it is she commands. Well, whatever the case, we've never been one to turn back when warned, so... Let's keep pressing onward. Into frozen Elaeum Lois. Well, we've got some interesting architecture over there to our right, but it looks like the leftward path leads right up to quite a grand cathedral type structure there. That seems like a good place to check out. Scare me. 
But first we had an old chaos, now we've got Ava is watching. Sounds like she's got all kinds of forces to array against us. Well, once again, Salad doesn't scare easy, so let's go on ahead in. apparently was the pet of the Ivory King. And we can't see it. Yep. Crown of the Ivory King isn't going to make the first boss encounter that easy on you. And it's not going to give us any kind of straight shot right to that big important cathedral structure either. No, I think it is technically possible to beat Ava without uh, being able to see her, but Ava is no pushover even when visible, so that's not a terribly likely outcome. No, our first goal here is going to find a way to make Ava visible, and then perhaps we can see what lies up in that big cathedral there. Alright then, folks, I think we've got our marching orders. Next time out, we're gonna take a crack at the Iron Passage, the co-op dungeon of the Crown of the Old Iron King DLC area, and then we're going to proceed onward into Frozen Elaim Lois and see if we can't find a way to make that king's pet show herself to us and make it a fair fight. I hope, as always, that you've enjoyed the journey so far, and I will... Look forward to seeing you next time for our journey into Frozen Elaim Lois. Always a pleasure, folks, and I will see you next time. It's a new year and a new month, and we do have one new patron this round who did not wish to be added to the list here, but I will give you an anonymous shout-out and thank you very much for your support. Thanks also, of course, to all the patrons who have been around since the last round, such as Justin Carpenter, Nolden, Zangamarth, Charlie Dunst, Anonymous Benefactor, John Madigan, Johnny Millennium, Sanguine Games, Misha Van Doren, Craig Patterson, Frank Grizzy, Tim J, Lolo De Puzzlo, Joshua C. Ritchie, Jared C. Rice, Darren Chow, Sonic Rose, EX Potemkin, Alicia Gorenson, Argyle Jelly, Mechazaurus, DG Jono, Doug Russell, August Fortnite, and the rest of the gang. I also appreciate all you wonderful commenters, subscribers, and watchers. Thank you very much for sharing the journey, and take care.